verse. It's a verse that I like. Uh, I like the way the Holy Spirit has wrote it because it gives a nice revelation. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is ruined. Let's, let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your blessings, and your truth. We thank you for all that we have. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now, the comfort of the people is a God, is the honor of the nation in which they live. This applies to any nation on the earth wants to have the God of creation be their God. Uh, it applies to the nation of Israel. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now, <clears throat> there's a large debate, and that will go on until the Lord returns as to whether America is or ever was The only thing I can tell you that those that know their history know that the founders chose the God of the Scriptures to call upon for the existence of America. I don't say all of our founders were saved men. It can be debated because the truth of the matter is only God knows who saved who. Only go by a man's profession and a man's walk to have a discernment. By their fruits you know them, but that's not always conclusive. It is uh, God who will reveal those that were truly repented and trusted in Christ. Now I tend to say that human beings can be, I don't know, 95 to 98 percent perceptive. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. There is a great glory dwelling in the land when the righteous do rejoice, when they have their liberty, the free exercise of their faith, and are not persecuted for it. There's one nation in modern times, in the last 200 years, that Christians could live in with complete freedom and not be persecuted. Also had the same privilege through the period of time in England, and through most of the other time of history, God's people have been persecuted in many countries. Now we're coming to a time that I am most concerned for our country, because when the righteous rejoice, there's great glory, but when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Isaiah, if you go back to the time of Israel, in ancient Israel, and the situations that happen in Israel are very parallel with American culture today and American history and American Christianity. We have times of great revivals, and we have most of our laws are based on Scripture. In fact, I wanted to show you due process and jury trial comes right from the scriptures. You'll find it in Matthew. If you turn with me to Matthew, Matthew 18, 
verse 15. This is the process. This is the process of justice. Whoever thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as the heathen man and the publican. Now, this is a very important word. Let's go back to it for just a moment. The way to deal with any wrongs, interpersonal wrongs. Individuals go to individuals and tell the truth one to another. Why would thy brother shall trespass? Now, notice it's a trespass. A trespass is not an offense. Excuse me, actually, I got to say, it's not an offending, because an offense can be a crime. A trespass is a violation of somebody else's right or property. You have to have something that's a trespass. One of the things today that people don't distinguish, especially in our government, and it is true, there's a difference between ethics and legality. Ethics are what moral men live by in principle in our soul. But law is what men break that they are accountable for. And what I say, what I mean by that is this. There are times that rare exceptions when one is not going to be considered ethical if it was going to be legal and vice versa. Now, this is just an opinion and we'd have to try it in the election that's taking place. And this is just from here. I probably shouldn't have because it ain't going to get out to anybody. It's my, just, it's my opinion. We have one man that lacks a lot of ethics in his dealing with other people another individual running that I think has violated law. I can't prove it because they won't form a grand jury and bring this to due process and find out. Um, how many of you think Mrs. Clinton has broke the law? But we, we can't prove it. you gotta, you got to have an indictment and you got to have a trial and you got to have a conviction. All right? A person is innocent until proven guilty. This is our law. And it's good and right comes from here, you see, because you're supposed to go and tell between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So if you go and tell somebody, well, you stepped on my toes, and they make it right, so I apologize, and here, let me wash your feet for you, and, and, and there's a restitution, whatever's necessary, and then there's complete repentance and forgiveness, then it's over with. Now, if you can't come to that resolution, this is the process of the legal system. It's called discovery. You take witnesses, and you go and put your facts and your spin before the witnesses, and they put their facts and their spin before the witnesses, and the witnesses establish every word. And if you still don't get a restitution, then you due process takes it before the court. Now, this is something you won't hear taught, people who don't understand this, but the three branches of our government are based off the scriptures, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, this uh, division of power, and you'll find the same principle in the, in the Bible here, these are the scriptures, okay, and the Holy Ghost is the legislative branch of government, okay, the pastor authority of the church, the executive, and the congregation is the judicial branch. You have your very three branches when you have scripture, when you have your authority, and you have your uh, judicial. And this is the way it's supposed to work. So, you, you go through the process, due process, just like in a court of law. See, the founders of our government Bible readers 
Bible verses, and they set up our laws as they were also being set up in England on the scripture. And the term of it was common law. It come, it's a natural law that comes from the scripture. What is natural law? Matthew 7, 12. Whatsoever man, uh, whatsoever uh, you would that men should do on you, you do so likewise in them. You are allowed to determine righteousness by, hey, if you don't want it done to you, if it ain't right for you, it's not right for somebody else. And you come to the conclusion of righteousness. How many want to be lied about? How many want to be stolen from? How many want to um, be murdered? How many want to be hurt or harmed in any way? See, that's how you determine right and wrong, good and evil. The scripture, the Holy Spirit bears witness to it. You have the Ten Commandments, and then you have 613 commandments. They deal with uh, interpersonal relationships. They deal with governmental relationships. They deal with um, congregational uh, relationships, social relationships. They, that's the law. The legislature is God. The Holy Spirit has legislated the scripture. And again, now in the New Testament, church, the congregation, the body is the judiciary, and your pastor your call to God is, is your authority. There are three authorities recognized to God. The government, the church, the pastor, and the father, the head of the home. That's God's government. The home, the church, and the government. The government, the state government. Alright, so don't get confused because the state government Now, here's something you want to see that Christians don't realize and that a lot of political correctness is coming to Christianity. Look at verse 18. Very last end you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever ye shall loose in earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whoop, I went too far. Verse 17. 17, I'm sorry. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if the church, uh, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as the heathen man and the publican. The church does not have any form of corporal punishment. The church only has exclusion. If you have somebody that is hurting and harming others and won't cease and desist and you can't get a restitution and it's, it's a judgment of the whole church and it's in whatever way they're hurting and harming unlawfully, then you exclude them from your membership. But notice how that you're to deal with them. See, now here's the thing. And pay attention to this. You've got this idea you're supposed to forgive everybody. Well, there's two ways to forgive. And you need to forgive everybody and everything so that you're free from the bondage of the sin and, and the desire for uh, vengeance. On the other hand, you cannot reestablish fellowship until you have repentance. Okay? You're n no one is going to heaven without repentance. Paul preached the gospel, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is very clear, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance is a change of mind, heart, or attitude in all kinds of definition, but it means you assent to God and his truth, or to righteousness and truth, that it's right, and you're going to turn from wrong to right. The righteousness of God is found in Jesus Christ, that's where you get your substitution for the blood atonement. This is, this is where you get all your basis for real law that's just. So, in, in excluding, they to be as the heathen man and the publican. Which leaves me in the situation, and people can argue about it all they want, but you're not to take a brother or sister to law because you have a court of law which you can deal with in the church when they'll submit to that court of law in the church and the judgment of the church. But if they're outside the church, then just because they say they're a Christian, that doesn't mean you should call the law. There's times that you call the law in the church when, not, when Christians commit crimes. Again, in Corinthians, we're dealing with, it's dealing with interpersonal relationships. Um, we just heard, and I won't tell you where, and 
I don't know the details of it, but a lady was telling my wife that uh, she was uh, in a church where somebody stole $80,000. We never had anybody steal $80,000. But if anybody steals $80,000 in this church, I'm going to the law. And I'm calling the police. Also, I'd like to know where it was hidden. <laughs> yeah. Where did that go? Okay, but um, Christians need to learn to study Scripture to know what's right. Now, back to where we started from. I went on a rabbit trail. When the righteous men rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, it is man of sin. There is a difference is the, 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 between a desire for justice and a desire for vengeance. Big difference. And it's not wrong for righteous people to desire to justice. Look at Isaiah 59, 15. Isaiah 59, 15. Yea, truth travels, and he that departs from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. God is displeased when there's no judgment. When the government countenances them that speak comfortably to them, and when they prosper and grow rich, and much more, when they are preferred and employed and have power put into their hands, then the righteous rejoice. And what goes to the wicked cannot be rejoiced. Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Now, the righteous will call for justice. Now, if somebody steals from somebody, it's the responsibility of the government when made aware of it, to arrest, try, and convict or exonerate. To seek justice. The advancement of the wicked is the eclipsing of the beauty of a nation. This is why America, this is why Tocqueville came to America. This is what he saw, and this is what he expressed. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. He saw a nation that desired righteousness and justice, equality before the law. And he said America was great. And I can't remember his exact words, but when America ceased to be righteous, America would cease to be great. When the wicked rise and come to power, they oppress all that is good and sacred. In Psalms 55, 3, it says, because the voice of the enemy, because the oppression of the wicked, for they uh, cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. If you're going to be godly and walk in godliness, you're going to incur a hatred from wicked people. Now, here's what I like most of all. A man is hidden. Now, you can deal with the hiding of a just man. But the real truth of the scriptures here is Jesus Christ is hidden. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, 1 Peter 3, 4. For that which is not corruptible, even the ordinance of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God, a great blessing. Why did Columbine occur? They, they made that statement years ago. Why did God let Columbine happen? Because we, where was God? We threw him out. He was hidden. We started getting God out of our society and culture back in the early 60s when we started having court decisions that got rid of the Ten Commandments. And the irony of it is, most of those Ten Commandment rulings did not get rid of the Ten Commandments. They set up the atmosphere that allowed people to reject the Ten Commandments. And Christians didn't demand that the righteousness of the law stay in the land. And some of the darndest things are said in those court decisions. Well, we can't let kids 
read the Ten Commandments might they might venerate them, they might learn them. The separation of church and state, uh, excuse me, the separation of church and state, a church is a body of Christians. It could be a Catholic church, a Baptist church, that was the separation of church and state. There was never a separation of God and righteousness in America until then. We had a model. We used to say the Pledge of Allegiance. That came out in the 50s, One Nation Under God. We used to sing in our historic songs, Our Liberty and Law, uh, and it used to sing, Great God, Our King. God was never separated in righteousness from the country until the 60s. That's when it started. So we're in this situation today. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now here it is. The wicked walk on every side, and the vilest men are exalted. And that's the situation you're dealing with. It is a necessity sometimes for saved people to abscond for his own safety. Corruption prevails so generally that as in Elijah's time, there seemed to be no good men left. And if you read the scriptures, it was such a depraved and, and despicable time. Elijah was the only man that had the courage to stand up. Isaiah tells us the situation. To show their countenance was witnessed against them, and they declare their sin is Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have reward of evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which please thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. This morning's message. We are saved by grace, we are kept by grace, and being kept in that grace, God expects us to be faithful in that grace. So, the bad news is this. The wicked walk so thickly on every side that it's going to get worse. This know also, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's the problem, they don't love God. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despise of those that are good. Notice the despising of the good, the hidden man, the, the good man, excuse me, uh, the man that's hidden. Traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, some such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep in the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, here's the truth, and this might cause your head to spin because I'm jumping around, but looking at this election, trying to draw some parallels in reality with the scriptures, I'm sure you all see in the news, and Christians take a note of it, but to get elected, the Democrats are calling upon their constituents to uh, bring forth music for them. And so Mrs. Clinton had uh, J.C. and Beyonce doing the music. The music was vulgar. The music was all the things that they're supposed to be against. They used the N-word, the F-word, rewarding for um, uh, adulterous uh, affairs, all kinds of wild things in the music. Here's what I want you to know. The Bible is very clear about music in the church. Church music, the Bible says that you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And here's what's happened today to the churches, why God has left the churches. Music in the church is to glorify God first. It's not a purpose to edify man. It's to glorify God. And what Americans have been doing for the last 
maybe the 40 years, is making their church music worthy to try to attract people, and especially the young people. Now, what you're going to attract with ungodly, worldly music is the Jay-Z and Dion's crowd of the Antichrist. They are not Christians. They're spiritual deviances. And that's what brought about our problems here. There was an individual that I allowed to come in here Jesse played some Christian music and some sensual music called the syncopated beat and I disapproved of it and I would not let it come in and that's when the battle began. And that's what you need to know. And that's what's racking the churches. We just had a major church split last fall, a major church in Auburn. It was over the emerging church and our godly music coming into the church. The people want emotional music, sensual music. Now the word sensual is very important because Jesse Cradle on Facebook confessed and admitted that he was singing sensual music. Only, there goes the word, not bad sensual, good sensual. The Bible says sensual, not having the spirit. There's no such thing as uh, good sensual music. Now, do you have liberty to listen to anything you want to listen? That is your liberty. That's not recommended or dictated, but not in church. It's the pastor's job to maintain music that glorifies God. That's his duty and obligation. Any questions? Because I covered a lot. Did that get too much of a hopping around? Was I reaching too far with everything on that scripture verse? Or did I cover a whole bunch of things there? Okay. All right. Let's bring our services to a close then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of the Christian. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your blessings.